um, we break it up into different discourses or different sections. In the first four chapters, uh, I kind of kind of called Jesus Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And in those chapters, Matthew told the account of Christ's genealogy, his birth, and the beginnings of his earthly ministry. Um, one of Matthew's driving purposes in his gospel account is that he would um, show his audience, demonstrate to his audience, that Jesus of Nazareth, was in fact and is in fact the Christ, the Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament. That's his overarching goal in his book. And the first four chapters make that really clear. Um, this Jesus that you've heard of, he, he, the one who died in, uh, on the cross, remember he lived that life that when you heard teach, he's actually the anointed one. That's Matthew's point. And Matthew draws in a number of Old Testament um, Old Testament prophecies and shows in the first four chapters how Jesus fulfilled those. This is the one you've been waiting for. Look no further. Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross, he rose again. He's the Savior. He's the anointed king you've been waiting for. That was the purpose, really, of the overarching purpose of Matthew. But the first four um, chapters really made that clear. Now in chapters 5 through 7, Matthew is going to immerse us deeply into Jesus' teaching. Okay, so we're going to see what's, um, <clears throat> what's called the Sermon on the Mount. The second discourse of Matthew is known as the Sermon on the Mount. You've probably heard that before because Jesus goes up on the side of a mountain and he preaches. He begins to preach to the people. The Sermon on the Mount spans three chapters and Jesus, Jesus covers numerous topics and um, essential areas of life. And everything um, that he says is truly profound. So we're going to go through this at a pace, these, these three chapters, at a pace that isn't rushing through it. We're also not going to um, go through it so slowly that we miss the bigger picture that's being um, portrayed here. So we will start with verses 1 through 6 today, and we will finish in chapter 7 with, um, in, in October, at the end of October. So that's, that's kind of looking at this discourse, how long we'll go, and then we'll do another series and then jump back into Matthew again. Okay, so we're going to begin with uh, verses 1 through 6 here in chapter 5. And um, just as we look at this, these are the words of God through the Apostle Matthew. These are the words of God through the Apostle Matthew. So follow along with me um, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Seeing the crowds, he, that's Jesus, went up on the mountain. And when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. I've entitled today's sermon, Supremely Blessed. Supremely blessed. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, what we see is what's come to be known or called as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. And we're going to look at the first four of them today. And the word Beatitude, not to be confused with the word attitude, although um, some will say these are the attitudes that we should be, and that's a good appropriate application. The word beatitude actually just means um, supreme blessing, supreme, supreme blessedness is what it means. And so each of these statements that Jesus makes is a, a characteristic of the life of someone who is blessed, says Jesus. This is a characteristic. These are truths about someone who lives a life that is, the word blessed here actually means happy, but not in a superficial sense, in the way that only God can make you happy. Okay, happy is the one who is poor in spirit, is what he's saying. Joy, right? Blessed is the one who's poor in spirit. That's the idea here. So there's eight Beatitudes. The word blessed here means happy in the most eternal, most glorious, most beautiful sense. Um, maybe we'd even substitute the word joy there. Okay, and that is what he's talking about. These are supreme blessings according to Jesus. What's so profound about the Beatitudes is that none of them, I would guess, would ever make the list of, that the world would put together of what it means to be blessed. They wouldn't look and say, oh, 
Yeah, poor in spirit. That sounds like a good one that should make the list. Our measure of happiness, right? The world wouldn't make that list. But Jesus does. Jesus declares these things as this is what joy is. This is a picture of a person who belongs to the kingdom. And these actually highlight, <clears throat> again, I apologize for my voice. I'm, I'm trying. These highlight basically what Jesus' entire ministry was about. It was about showing us that the way of the kingdom is opposite of what you think. It's, it's not what you think. Remember he told Pontius Pilate at the end of his life, he said, at his trial, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. He was not saying his kingdom is not in this world and coming to this world. He wasn't saying that it's going to be separate forever. In fact, he was breaking in to bring his kingdom to the world, just like we saw last week in Psalm 72. Um, may the kings, it was a prophecy of Christ, may the king have dominion from the river to the ends of the earth. So his kingdom is coming to earth. But it's not of the world. It's not like the world. The things you've seen in sin and pride, that's not how I operate. That's not how I operate. Um, do I need to get another mic? I'm good? Okay. Okay. Um, that's not how I operate, says Jesus. This is different. My kingdom looks different than what you think. And so in, in this, we see that the kingdom of God, the blessings and success, this measure of what is truly good according to God, um, is very different than the way the sinful world, this fallen world, sees success in measure. God's measure of success, church family, his measure of blessing and what makes people truly happy and satisfied requires that we begin with humility. We have to begin with humility. The root of our sin problem, as I've told you in the past, is pride. If you look at every sin, it really amounts to a root of pride. I, I want to be Lord of my life. I want to make my own way. It's pride. Every sin starts with pride. And so the antidote to that is humility. And when you look at the Beatitudes, when you look at these statements... Every single one of them requires humility. They all start with humility. And so that's what Jesus is communicating. He's saying, you have followed the teachings of the Pharisees and the scribes for a long time, and they have lost their way. The way that they think about righteousness is very self. It's self-righteousness. <clears throat> the way they think about um, what they're doing is very prideful. They love to stand on the street corners and pray, right? You'll hear that in chapter 6. They love to fast and make themselves look really, really bad so everybody knows they're fasting. They virtue signal, okay? That's what they're doing. And so when we think about what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, listen, if you want to know what the kingdom's like, you've got to start with humility. You've got to humble yourself. Or you're not going to be able to enter my kingdom. You're not going to be able to know what the kingdom's like because God, even though he's great and he makes much of his name, he needs nothing from us. He doesn't need us to glorify him. It's not an ego thing. It's actually for our good. God is a humble God. A God who, in, in the, through Christ, God the Son, humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. God is a humble God. And so he teaches us humility. And that's what the, the, the Beatitudes are. At first glance at these statements, our flesh in its pride would think, this is foolish. This isn't blessed. This is the opposite of blessing. <clears throat> be poor in spirit, meek. No, I want to be strong. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to be strong. I want to, I want to shine in my own glory. Our flesh fights against the truth. But God's ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. And so the Beatitudes are a perfect example of this humility. The opposite of what you think in your prideful flesh is what leads to life. The opposite of what you think is what leads to life. Remember what Jesus said, if you try to find your life on your, on your own, being Lord of your life and making your own way, if you try to find your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your li life for my sake, if you'll give up those things, turn away and come to me with both hands open and say, I want you instead, you'll find your life. If you try to find your life, you'll lose it in this world. But if you lose your life for my sake, whether that's literal or you lose everything for him, you leave behind everything that isn't good and you follow Jesus instead, that's where you're going to find life. So the opposite of what we think in our flesh, our fallen flesh, is what leads to life.
That is the point of the Beatitudes. Jesus is showing us that. So let's look at verses 1 through 3 again. It says, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So chapter 4 ended with Jesus going throughout all of Galilee, proclaiming the gospel, and then healing people, and casting out demons, and doing these miraculous things. And people, the crowds started gathering around. And now these crowds have gathered around, and they are coming in, and there's so many that the only way he can really speak to them is to go up on a mountain so they can see him and hear him better. So Jesus goes up on this mountain, and his disciples gather close to him. And then there's many people who are probably within earshot. And of course, Jesus is God. So I imagine that he didn't need a microphone. He just supernaturally made it so everyone could hear him. He came to preach the gospel. So he's going to allow that to happen. That's a miracle that he could speak to thousands of people and they hear him. So Jesus starts preaching from the top of the mountain. And, and, and he opens his mouth and he taught them. His primary goal was his 12 disciples, but he certainly was teaching everyone else as well. And the first thing that he says really may have been surprising, even shocking to the people listening to him. You see, for many years now, the teaching that they have heard from the scribes and the Pharisees and the the priests, that teaching that they've heard for many years now has always been superficial. It's always been do these things externally and make sure that you let people know you're doing them and that's what makes you righteous. In fact, his own disciples had a wrong perception of it because when Jesus met the rich young ruler, remember what he said at the end when the rich young ruler walks away at Jesus' offer to come follow him? He walks away and Jesus says, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And the the disciples were just blown away. Well, who can be saved then? What Jesus was pointing out was, is he was was showing them that um, riches, if someone's rich, it doesn't necessarily mean that God's favor is upon them. It is not wrong or a sin to be rich. It's an area of temptation, just like there's many areas of temptation, that if that's part of your life, that's a good thing, but you got to be careful of. But what Jesus was showing them was, you have heard the Pharisees tout and show their beautiful garments and their, their riches and all that, and you assume that God's favor was on them because of their earthly riches. And I'm telling you that's not true. Just because someone has earthly blessing does not mean that God's favor is upon them. It does not mean that. And so they're blown away when he says that. And this is a very similar kind of statement, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who, um, who have this humility. What does poor in spirit mean? What does that really mean? One of the things that J- Jesus did through his teaching was he was cleaning up the mess that the scribes and the Pharisees and Sadducees and priests had made of God's law. He's clarifying this is what God's law really is. And when he says blessed are the poor in spirit, it's actually perfectly consistent with what God says he cares about most in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Wow. So God cares, what he cares most about in our lives is what's on the inside. Because you can be like the Pharisees and be a whitewash. You can look beautiful on the outside, but you're really a whitewashed tomb. You're dead on the inside. God cares about the heart. And so when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, if you are poor in spirit, if you humbly recognize the overwhelming poverty of your life and spirit as it is steeped in sin and fallenness, then you are blessed. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Why? Because... Only if you have a heart and soul that's broken over your own sinfulness can you actually see your need for a Savior. You can't see your need for him if you don't. That's why when we preach the gospel to people, Ray Comfort does this really well. 
it's very important to start with the law. That's what Jesus is doing here. The whole Sermon on the Mount is Jesus starting with the law and then putting people so far back in the corner that they're actually burdened heavy. Wow. Who can live up to this, God? Who can, who can stand this? And then in chapter 11, that's when Jesus says, at the end of chapter 11, he says, come to me, all you who are heavy burdened, heavy laden. Why are they heavy burdened? Because he burdened them. He said, look, the law is so heavy. If you really understand the law the way God said, it's perfection. And so then he comes and says, I've taught you the law the way you should know it. Not just external, it's about your heart. And no one can live up to this righteous standard. But I can. And I did. And I can give you that righteousness. Jesus is the gospel. When he says, come to me all who are heavy, heavy burdened, and my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He was talking about the law. He wasn't just talking about struggles in life. He was talking about people he had just literally lambasted with the law the way it should be. He put him down and he said, there's hope. Come to me. I lived it out. Trust me and I'll give you life. That's amazing. So that's what he's doing here. He's beginning to share the law as it should be. And he's showing them, blessed are the poor in spirit, the, the people who see their need for me, that's who's blessed. That's who's who the kingdom belongs to. Amen? The kingdom belongs to those who know that they don't deserve it and who know that there's nothing that they can do or say or offer God to get it. They are in complete and total, they're, they're at the complete and total mercy of God. And all they can do is surrender and plead for grace. And, and the good news is um, God is full of mercy and grace. Amen. Jesus, Jesus came. He lived the perfect life. He was, he was more poor in spirit than anyone. He who was rich became poor so that you who are poor can become rich, not in earthly things, but in eternal things. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So here we see Jesus describe the natural, natural response of one who is truly poor in spirit. There's mourning, there's crying, there's brokenness and weeping and a deep sorrow over sin. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, for, for godly grief, for godly sorrow, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief or worldly sorrow produces death. So let me unpack this a little bit. What is a godly sorrow that leads to salvation versus a worldly sorrow over sin or something you did wrong um, that leads to death? Um, godly grief is one that produces a true and sincere and, and sincere repentance. Um, I apologize about that. Is there anything I can do about the popping? Nothing? Okay. No worries. All right. Switch mics? I'll switch mics. All right. I got Brooklyn's mic. Is that okay? Good? Okay. <clears throat> so... This godly sorrow is one that produces a true and sincere repentance. Um, one that grieves because you've sinned against God. Not just because um, you have gotten caught or things didn't work out for you the way you hoped they would. A godly sorrow starts with the Lord. Um, David, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband killed, um, in battle, he put him in a position where he would die to cover up his sin. David, after Nathan came to him, David repented and he had a truly godly sorrow. And you find that in Psalm chapter 51. But I just want to show you verse 4. It says, David cries out, he says, Against you, God, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Wait a minute. You sinned against Bathsheba. You sinned against her husband, her family, whatever it was. Against you and you alone, God. What David recognized was the distance, the, the, the distance between his sin and its offense to God and other people who are sinners also is massive. 
doesn't mean that he also didn't repent of sinning against Bathsheba. It just means when we sin and, and commit offense against God, it is far above any other thing. David cared about the fact that he sinned against his maker. That's what he cared about. That's a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow that leads to true repentance in a, in a, a, a sinner's life that leads to salvation or even a saved person's life that leads to sanctification. A godly sorrow is, God, first and foremost, I've sinned against you. You're perfect. You're sinless. And I did this thing that did not image you well. I'm sorry, and I have failed. Would you rescue me? But a worldly sorrow over sin is not concerned about God in the matter. It's only sad that he or she has lost something earthly and suffered earthly consequences. Esau is a great example of this. The Bible says that God hated Esau and he loved Jacob. This is fascinating. So Esau has this birthright because he's the firstborn. And he decides to trade it to Jacob for a bowl of stew. He trades something that represents really ultimate, an ultimate gift for something that's very temporary. And God does not like that because ultimately those who are saved are those who traded something temporary and said, I want something eternal, right? Jacob was willing to steal it, even deceive his father just to get the birthright. And this in God's heart showed him that Jacob's heart desired that which was better and good, and he wouldn't trade it for something small and temporary. Now, Jacob had a lot of sins. That's amazing. He, he was mentioned as having more sins than even Esau. But Esau's heart was far from God. In fact, he tried to seek repentance even with tears, but they weren't tears for sinning against God. They were tears because he lost something earthly, and he didn't even see the value in it even after he lost it. He didn't understand that it was actually a foreshadowing picture of eternal life, a foreshadowing picture of the birthright that Christ has given us through his sacrifice as the one and only begotten son who made us, who were enemies, sons and daughters through his cross. That's amazing. So Esau's sorrow was not a godly sorrow. Esau didn't have the same kind of mourning um, that leads to uh, being comforted and so when we look at these, these things, um, God loves a heart that desires eternal over temporal, heavenly over earthly, and him, the joy of him over the pleasure of sin. That's what God loves. That's what he looks at. Again, the heart. And it, they love him to the point of brokenness, a mourning, a godly sorrow. As Paul writes in Romans 7, verses 24 and 25, he says, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. They shall be comforted with what? The gospel. The gospel. If you mourn over your sin, if you're broken over your sin, you'll be comforted. There's good news. You can be saved. But you got to see it first. And we can only see it through the power of the Holy Spirit opening our eyes and our heart. Paul's hope was in Christ to save him. The gospel, the good news, is a person, not just a plan of salvation. It's a person, and his name is Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, says Jesus. And there's no greater comfort to sinners than God's grace, amen? This leads us to verse 5. Verse 5 says this, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What on earth is meekness? <laughs> it's such a weird word, and I think a lot of us don't understand it. And I even am not sure I fully understand it, but here's what I've gathered as I've started to study it and understand it. And it's actually the one in this uh, text, this first passage, when I challenge you at the end, um, is going to be what, what the attitude in these first four stands out to you. Which one is God working on in your life the most? For me, I think I'd say it's probably meekness and really just understanding what it is and how it applies. But meekness is not weakness, though it is humble enough to acknowledge all weaknesses in our need for Christ. But rather what meekness is, is it is strength and passions submitted to Christ's lordship and his power and his will. Meekness is recognizing that Jesus' strength is better. Amen? His, better, his strength is better. His will, his ways are better. That's meekness. And so what that leads to is a life that's surrendered to Christ's will and is patiently enduring every trial of this life not trusting yourself, but in him 
who will reward you with a reward that only he can give. That's meekness. To approach life with a humility towards God and to understand that I have submitted my strength to him where he says be strong, where he says um, be humble, where he says be gentle, I am gentle. I am submitted to him because his strength is better. Jesus demonstrated meekness toward the Father, right? Jesus is truly God, and yet he submitted to the Father's will. He said, I don't say anything except for what the Father says. I don't do anything except for what I see the Father do. That was Jesus. And so Jesus will not return in meekness. He will return in power, right? But he came in meekness to show us what it looks like to have a relationship with him. Those who try to take the earth um, by their own will and their own strength and through violence will, in the end, lose everything. They will lose everything. But those who trust in Christ, who endure with Christ, who share in the sufferings of Christ in this life, they will also share in the reward, the new heaven and the new earth, glorification and the inheritance of eternal life as sons and daughters. That's meekness. This, uh, the, those who are strong in themselves, the wicked, they're going to be taken away. But the meek, they're going to be they're going to be taken away. God's going to remove them from the earth. Okay, just as it tells us in Matthew 24. He's going to remove them. And those who remain, those who were strong in Christ, those who were meek, um, those ones who submitted their lives to Christ and delight in his glory instead of their own, the meek shall inherit the earth. We are going to live here, okay, in the new heaven and new earth. It's, we go to heaven in the intermediate state. Our souls go there. If you die today and Christ hasn't returned, you, your soul goes to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what Paul said. That's an, what we call the intermediate state. But when God makes all things new, the new heaven and new earth, Jerusalem, new Jerusalem comes down to earth adorned as a bride. New Jerusalem isn't just a place. It's the people. It's us in Christ. And it says we're going to live here. Earth 2.0, right? New Genesis. The new Genesis has already begun. If you're in Christ today, you are a new creation in Christ, the Bible says. He started the all things new. I'm making all things new. He started with us. And then everything else will be made new too. Okay? And the meek, those who are in Christ, will inherit the earth. It, it's our gift. The new earth and the new heaven are our gift. What a blessing. So this is a patient and humble endurance. And we see the same in Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, <clears throat> who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So meekness and its glorious reward right there in Christ's life. And we are to be Christ-like, right? And so we want to be meek as well and understand what that means. All right, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, says the word. It is like you're seeing righteousness to your soul, to your spirit, to your life before God in the same way that you would see food and water if you were in a desert and there was nothing and you were starving. Okay? Like, those who love my righteousness. And Paul makes this really clear later on in Philippians 3 when he shares his testimony about God's righteousness versus man's righteousness. Remember Paul shared his testimony. He says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. He shares his testimony. He says, all of that, meaningless, completely meaningless. I, it's not going to earn me anything. My righteousness falls short of perfection, so therefore it's no good. If I trust in my own righteousness, I will perish. I need a better righteousness. So Paul says in, in Philippians um, chapter 3, he goes on and he says, um, not having a righteousness of my own. I've given up everything. I've lost everything. And he was speaking about his, his credentials. His, he was speaking about his resume okay, of righteousness. I've lost it all for the sake of gaining Christ. I'd rather have him. It's all rubbish compared to him. Because only he can give me true righteousness. I, I don't have a righteousness of my own that comes through the works of the law by my own flesh and strength. I want a righteousness that comes from God 
only on the basis of faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. You cannot earn your way. There are two standards of righteousness, church family. There is man's standard, which lived out to its maximum is in the Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says on the outward, he was blameless. I mean, I don't even know one person that's outwardly blameless. He said he was. He was so concerned about that because he believed that that was going to earn him eternal life. That he was meticulous in public. He was made sure nobody ever saw him do anything outside the law of God. But inwardly, he knew that his thoughts weren't right. He knew that he had vain lusts and passions just like all of us. And when Christ came, he showed him, he blinded Paul in order to open Paul's eyes, the eyes of his heart, right? And that's the same thing he did in each of our lives. He helped you see, no, you are not enough. The problem is not outside of you. The problem is you. You have sinned against the holy God and you deserve condemnation. God is pure and holy. You cannot be in my presence. I want you to be in my presence, but you can't be because you've sinned. I need to clean you. I need to cleanse you. I need to give you a better righteousness, the righteousness of God. God's standard is perfection. There are not scales. You will not get to heaven and think to yourself, and, and God will say, oh, well, let's see if you did more good than bad. If you did more good than bad, you can come in. That is not the judgment day. The judgment day is simple. Did you have perfect righteousness or did you not? And the only way we get that, the Bible says God's gift was through faith in Jesus. This highlights a, a beautiful doctrine that theologians call imputation. That God actually gives us his righteousness. He counts his righteousness through Christ as though it's ours. It's actually the doctrine of double imputation. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake he, the Father, made him Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God, on the cross, the Father imputed your sin and my sin into Christ and treated him as though he had done everything sinful that you've ever done. So that he could impute Christ's life righteousness, his performance, to you and count what he did as though you did all of those good things and none of the bad. That's imputation. And it comes to us through faith and by the Holy Spirit living in us, the righteousness of God. You, church family, if you've trusted in Christ, you are positionally forever righteous before God. He looks at you and he sees Jesus. You are positionally righteous. And your sanctification now on this earth and then the culmination of that at the end, your glorification, is the process by which God, through his spirit in you, is making you look like practically what you are positionally. Got it? He is making you like what he said you are. That's amazing. Don't ever, ever uh, let that slide from your amazement and awe. That is amazing. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that you could become the righteousness of God through him. That's amazing. And so when we think about this righteousness, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When we think about all of these beatitudes so far and the rest to come, it becomes abundantly clear that Jesus is teaching us what the journey of a sinner to salvation looks like. This humble faith, you're broken over your sin. You realize, you're, you're mourning over it. You realize, wow, I am a sinner and he is a holy God and he's my only hope and he's my joy and he satisfies everything that I've tried to find joy in in life. He is those things. In my old life, I wanted everything that God was, but I didn't want it to be him. And now I want it to be him. I, the spirit has quickened my heart. He's changed me. He's made me alive. And now I desire these things. I desire him and I see that my sin is in my life and I want him to change me. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. I'm submitting my life to Jesus. He is a better Lord. He is a better Savior than me. I am a terrible Lord of my life. I'm not even a good person. 
by his standard. I need him. He's better. And then you see the rest of them. Blessed are those who are merciful. Why? They'll, re they'll receive mercy. But we know that, that that idea, as we get to the rest of them, all of those were preceded anyways. Jesus actually gave mercy so that you could um, give mercy so that you could receive more mercy. These are people who have taken a journey. What Jesus is talking about, this is the journey of salvation. You humble yourself and believe in him instead. And suddenly you're like, wow, the sin that I once loved, I hate. And the God that I once hated, I love. The righteousness that I once didn't care about, now I hunger and thirst for it like I'm in a desert and I'm starving to death. I long for it. And Jesus says, you will be satisfied. That's imputed righteousness. I will give it to you as a gift. If you trust in me, if you trust in me, not partly, wholeheartedly trust in me, jump in. A great illustration for this um, is a swimming pool. If you go to a pool and you just dip your feet in, can you tell people that you went swimming? No, you cannot. If you're going to go swimming, you got to jump off the diving board. You got to get in the water. Jesus does not want your feet in the pool kind of faith. That doesn't count. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Jump in. If you start drowning, I'll save you. You will start drowning. I will rescue you. Jump all in with him. Take the whole plunge. That's what he's doing. These are not, the Beatitudes are not a list of things that a person should work hard on to become and then thereby earn the blessings that are attached to them. That's not what Jesus is saying. He is breaking the legs of his people. He's saying, look, you think that you can live this out. You can't. Look at this. I'm talking about the heart. He's not just talking about external stuff. He's like, I'm going to go right to the heart and soul. This is what your heart has to look like. And, and anybody there who, who was really humbling themselves and listening was like, I am nowhere close to this, Jesus. Nowhere close. It shows them their need for him. That only one can live out this standard perfectly, and that is Jesus Christ. That's the entire point of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the whole point. And he'll, we'll just keep going back to this and we'll see every area and we'll talk about the application of what Jesus said. But we'll also end with the gospel. Like, none of us live this out perfectly. Jesus lived this out perfectly. That's the whole Sermon on the Mount. And again, in chapter 11, he finally says after they're pounded down on the ground of like, oh, man, we are nothing. There's no hope, Lord. The law is too hard. And Jesus says, I know. Come to me, all who are heavy, all who are burdened. Take on my yoke. It's easy. Uh, you can believe in me, and I'll live the life you can't. And then I'll count it as though you did. It's almost scandalous, okay? Like, it's like, whoa, that's grace. That's amazing grace. How, how can you do this, God? I'm God. I'm, I'm just and the justifier at the cross. I punish sin the way I needed to. And it also saves sinners for your sake and for my glory. It's amazing. So as we think about these again, the answer isn't us. The Beatitudes help us see the answer is not me. The answer is Jesus. He's the freedom I need. As you go this week, I want to encourage you to think about these Beatitudes, these first four. Which one is applying to your life most clearly right now? What is God working on in your life? Maybe it's meekness. Maybe it's poverty um, of the spirit. Because you got to think even after salvation, yes, this is a journey of salvation, but even after salvation, we continue to grow in these things. But now you have Christ, the spirit living in you, the Holy Spirit living in you to help you. So you keep growing in these things. What is God working on in your life in these first four Beatitudes? And as you see those things, what does it look like for you to see that Jesus lived them out perfectly? And so you don't go home and try harder now, even as a Christian. You may add disciplines to your life, um, start reading and studying about these things more. But you don't trust in your own strength to actually apply them. You look and you behold Jesus. We talk about this all the time. Behold the glory of Christ and how he lived it out perfectly so that you can believe more deeply in him. So then, through his grace, by seeing he did it better, he actually transforms you. You become like him. Behold, believe, and then become. And that comes from 2 Corinthians 3.18. We are, when we behold the glory of the Lord, 
we are transformed from glory to glory, from one degree to the next, in the same image as Jesus. So there's something miraculous that happens when we recognize an area in our life that needs to grow, then we behold how Jesus did it better, and then we ask Jesus to now to do it better through us because he lives in us. That's how you really change in the kingdom. That's how you actually be sanctified. Yes, your disciplines and going home and setting forth some things in your life that will help you is really important. But too often Christians will go home and set the disciplines, but they don't have any power. The power comes from beholding Jesus. Take a moment, just be really in awe of him for like the whole day. Wow, you were no one was poor in spirit like you, Jesus. No one was meek like you, Jesus. No one hungered and thirsted for righteousness like you, Jesus. You were perfect in righteousness. No one was like you. And just enjoy that for a whole day, just Jesus like that. And you watch how God will change you to be more meek, more poor in spirit, and more, more um, humble in the way that you approach life and approach God. Amen? I want to invite the worship team up. Thank you, Lord. I was really close to losing my voice, but we made it through. Thank you for enduring. Let's, uh, I'm going to pray.